Let Keepers Tell, Chapter 3. Sebi was up bright and early, just as the sun had appeared over the horizon. He kept constantly nudging his friend until finally he opened his eyes and woke. Come on, get up. The day is just beginning. Let's go down to the sea before anyone else has risen. Stilling the days and moaning that it was the middle of the night, Auric struggled to his feet, rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and followed Sebi to saddle the horses. By the time they had ridden down to the sandy beach, Auric was now fully awake. The sun had riven over the hills behind him in a flaming orange ball. Red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning, remarked Sebi. Was lucky we're not shepherds then, said Auric. Then he spoke again. No, we are men of Angeln. We are people of the sea. And over that murky grey channel lies our destiny. I wonder what Britain is like. Said I have heard only a few things. My mother used to tell us stories. I know that about 40 years ago, the Romans ruled there. They made it their home for nearly 400 years. When the empire began to crumble, the legions left. The island came under attack from wild men of the north and the Irish from the west. So the wealthy Britons paid our people to defend them. Our tribes in the past often worked as mercenary for the Roman states. This was when our leaders recognised Britain was the sacred land of the prophecies. What prophecy, Ulrich? Something about the goddess Nertha's mystical isle and that the Lord Ing would lead us there. If that's the bloody case, why didn't we go then? Well, from what I remember what my mother told me, there came a great chieftain of the Britons who united his people and drove our warriors back to a small area on the coast. His time has gone and ours has come again. Where did you hear about it this inn? Where did your mother hear about these stories? My mother used to talk to many different people. She was interested in the origins of our race. She used to tell me and Anna stories when we were just children. Ulrich, I don't know about you, but I am bloody starving. Last one backs the horses, packs the horses for the other. Come on, hurry up, you pox-ridden weasel. I'm going. Sebi galloped off in the direction of the camp, whooping and hollering to get his horse to go faster. Auric was close behind, laughing his head off. He thought to himself, Sebi was a good friend to have, for in troubled times there was no better tonic than laughter. As soon as they got back, they made their way to where the women were baking bread for the journey. Auric tried to sneakily slip a loaf away without them seeing. Smack! Rowena wrapped him across the hand with her great wooden spoon. His fingers smarted and throbbed, and he cradled his embarrassing wound. Come now, you are both now warriors, not little boys. Just ask for the bread politely, my young lords, and you will receive. Rowena, please may we have some lovely fresh break baked bread, begged Sally, Sebi with a big cheesy grin on his face. I will be delighted to serve you, my lord. She passed him a large, warm loaf. Now hurry along, gentlemen. We ladies have real work to do. Rowena was a captive of their tribe, taken from the Roman scouting party some ten years ago. She was not Roman, she was a Briton, with flaming red hair and emerald green eyes. Some said she was a witch. That was normally other women who were jealous of the fact that she enchanted men just with her beauty alone. Add to that her razor-sharp wit, and she was a force to be reckoned with. Rowena, what is Britain really like? asked Auric. The magical woman looked up and straight back at Auric mesmerizing with a dreamlike stare. You'll soon find out, more wondrous than you can ever imagine. Mystical and wild, there are those who still live like the Romans, but not my people. We lived on the frontier, maybe two days ride west of the Great Henge. We followed the old ways of the Druids. We kept our teachings secret and our healers hidden. The New York Lords called my people the Welsh. It means stranger in the Saxon tongue. The Romans labelled our lands Cambria. To us it was Cymru, my home. The whole island oozes magic. All who set foot on her soil want to possess her for themselves. Soon you'll find out, little lords, all are enchanted by her beauty. She will reach in and steal your heart. A playful smile danced across Arena's face. Serbi spoke, not thinking the red-headed Cirrus could hear. Is it me? Or do her people sound like a load of nutters? Bang! Rowena launched the wooden spoon, hitting the boy on the back of the head. Oi, you two, shall I get you some skirts or can you carry on prattling with the other women? Get over here and help with the wagons. 
the voice of Oswald boomed across the camp. Sebby tore the loaf in half and handed a chunk of the warm, soft bread to his partner in crime. As they passed by Oswald, he gave Auric a playful kick up the arse, but gave Sebby a real dead arm. The boy winced and grabbed his shoulder. Why don't you fart? It will take your mind off it. Oswald loved his own jokes and laughed out loudly. Fat tosser, Sebby mumbled under his breath as he rubbed his throbbing shoulder. What was that? Do you think I'm deaf as well as fat? Oswald grabbed a thin stick and chased Sebby across the camp, swinging at his ass. But it didn't last long. He couldn't run for laughing. Bent over, hands on his knees, coughing, giggling and gasping for air. Auric lad, water now. The warlord's face was as red as a beetroot. The boy set off to fetch his lord some drink. Has he gone? Came a whispered voice from out of the bushes. I think you're safe. Sebby stepped out of his hiding place. The best thing you can do is go and apologise. Not mucking likely. I'm going to keep a low profile until he forgets. And I'll set off to find an even more obscure. Sorry, Sebby set off to find an even more obscure location to dwell until the convoy moved out. Auric returned to his lord with a flask of water. Thank you, boy. Where's that bloody joker? Well, he was hiding in the bushes. Now he could be anywhere. Oswald chuckled some more. He makes me laugh, the little horseborn. Don't tell him I forgive him just yet. Let him stew for an hour or two. With pleasure, my lord. No scouting for you two today. You did your bit yesterday. You'll be in the middle of the column and a nice easy ride. Go tell that damn gem, Jester. Thank you, my lord. The boy left in search of his elusive friend. They travelled for maybe two hours. And they now crossed through the lands of the Saxons, who were their closest allies. Eventually, they came to a huge sandy bay. There were several ships pulled up on the beach, and some of the other Engel tribes were already loading the boats. There was much backslapping, laughter, joking as old friends met. The Engels are people who live for the day, love life, and have no fear of death. Whether it is on the battlefield or the feasting hall, they were not to be messed with. All Auric knew from past experience, there would be lots of drinking, singing, and some extremely tall stories. First, there was the Council of the Warlords, where plans were to be discussed, and new Oswald's news of Oswin's death, and the new king's rise would be honoured. Bury a king, feast on the beach, then sleep on board. These were Oswald's orders agreed by King Wolfer, and they sounded good to all the other warriors. Our people were now safe from attack and could relax and let go. All except the very unlucky few. These were the men who were being chosen to set sail on the tide, which meant no hour for them. The two boys were not picked, as this was a task for experienced sailors. Sevy and Ulrich were about to take their first voyage. Tis only then do you find out if you're really a man of the sea. The feasting started. The younger, younger warriors all sat together, maybe 30 or more. Ulrich's battle story was hot topic as the mead generously flowed. Then Ulrich asked, Enough of what is known. I want to know is, what is a great henge? There were moans and shaking of heads as the boy repeated Rowena's tale. And then Sebi chirped up. Do you think it's a giant hen, like some sort of fuck off chicken that eats men and runs wild? The group burst out laughing, rolling around and making chicken sounds. All right, don't take the piss. I'm not clucking mad. By now, Sebi had everyone in fits of laughter doing a chicken strut around the fire with his head bobbing back and forth. An older warrior stepped out of the shadows and addressed the boisterous youths. I have heard of it. It is a holy place, like our own sacred groves. The Imperial Roman army feared it, and you idiots should too. Now, you lot, make your way to the ships. There's an early start tomorrow. The drunken youths staggered to their feet and off towards the boats, waiting at the beach. Once on board, they knocked and bumped into everything, including people already on the deck trying to sleep. Oh, sorry, sorry, didn't see you. Sorry, whispered Ulrich as he trampled on the scattered passengers. Just bloody lie down, you drunken fool, shrieked an old woman who violently lashed out with her staff and caught Sebi right on the point of his elbow. Oh, yelped the boy as he tripped over random legs and piled headlong into nobody other than less than Rowena. Then all bloody hell broke loose. The women started beating the poor lad with pots, pans, ladles and brooms. As usual, Rowena preferred her trusty wooden spoon. The last thing he saw of his friend was his ass as it leapt for cover over the side back to the beach in safety. In the dark distance, a voice cried out, Those muckers are going to kill me. Death by cooking utensils is not a good way to go. 
there's no honor in it. I'm out of here. I'll see you in the morning. Ulrich dropped where he stood, still smiling at his friend's antics, and fell into a deep, drunken slumber. Early morning was grey and wet. The water was grey and wet. The smell of damp farm animals, moist leather, and the odour of hairy men filled Ulrich's nose. All these nasal delights compared with the constant motion of the ship, made for a feeling of impending doom. The sea rolled, so did the boy's head, then his stomach, then the remains of last night's feasting, until it ended up over the side, where seagulls swooped down to gobble up the warm delights. Didn't you say us angles are people of the sea? Sebi remarked, looking fresh, lively, and loving every moment of his first voyage on the open sea, even more than observing his friend's seasickness. I bloody well nearly missed the ship, but Oswald woke me early. You look really rough, mate, he smirked. Finally, a chink in his armour. Don't worry, my friend, I'll watch over you. I'll keep you safe. It's not the sea. It's too much owl last night, and maybe I've got food poisoning. Oswald walked over, put his hand on Sebby's shoulder, and asked, What's this? Is young Ulrich under the weather? It's a case of food poisoning, my lord, replied the lad. Lord Oswald smiled and winked at the boy. What he needs is a nice, greasy, juicy mutton leg. Ulrich turned green, the projectile vomited a good ten feet over the side of the boat. His father was just the same, no better man to have beside you in the shield wall. On board ship, he was as much used as a horse with no legs. Watch over him, lad. Make sure he doesn't call it quits and throw himself in. He could save your life, Se excuse me. He could save your life one day. He already has, my lord, Sebri replied as Oswald walked away. Ulrich suffered the entire journey. There was no respite from his symptoms, and his new but loyal friend stood by as nursemaid. It seemed like every warrior in the ship came by to gloat and pass some sort of derogatory comment, all at Auric's expense. He could not care less. He was halfway between life and death. He was lost in the Frithgarth, having nightmares of giant chickens pecking at his head and seeing visions of the raven cawing loudly in his ears and then seeing its shadow pass over the grey clouds. This was all interrupted by periods of dry spewing and there was not a single drop of fluid left in his entire body. A day, a night, and a day passed in a fevered haze. He had prayed to every god known to him, made vows impossible to keep. He had asked for some mercy from his torture. Then, as the darkness fell, Sebi saw a beacon fire. Land ahead, the joker called out as it was his turn on watch. For the first time in the entire journey, Ulrich felt some sort of joy, be it very faint. He struggled to his knees and dragged himself with Sebi's help, who was now standing beside him, to prop himself on the side of the boat. Both boys stared into the darkness. They could see one beacon, then another. Small fires broke through the blanket of the night. If you stared really hard, you could just make out dark figures gathered around each hearth. Men from the ships called to the shore. Greetings in Saxon tongue came back. The boat made its way into the shallows. All the warriors... All the warriors, that is, who were able, jumped into this water to help beach the boat as high on the shoreline as possible. Auric saw dry land, dry land. He summoned enough strength to drop over the side and into the stony beach. He staggered up onto the pebbles and collapsed. Leave him, Sebi. You help the others. He'll be as weak as a kitten. That is the worst case I've ever seen. Just let him sleep there, Oswald intervened. Yes, my lord. Where is this place? What village? The boy replied. Look up there. The warlord pointed to the top of the muddy cliffs. That was the headland encampment of the High Lord Hengist. We are now guests of the Saxons and must be on our best behaviour. Enough questions. Go help the others. The huge warrior and his young friend left Ulrich passed out on the beach to recover from his ordeal. <laughs>